At 30 degrees Celsius, pure water and a solution of ethylene glycol have nearly the same vapor pressure. As temperature increases, so do both vapor pressures. But when the vapor pressure of water reaches one atmosphere, ethylene glycol is at almost half that. Pure water boils at a significantly lower temperature than does the ethylene glycol solution. Because the solute is blocking the solvent from going into the gas phase, the vapor pressure at a given temperature is usually lower than the solvent, okay? So as an example there in that video, at 100 degrees Celsius, where water by itself boils, the ethylene glycol was only about 400 millimeters of mercury, quite a bit less vapor pressure. So it takes an extra amount of energy, i.e. an increase in temperature, in order to get the ethylene glycol solution to boil. And this delta T, all right, which you can see in the lower right kind of picture right there, this delta T is nothing more than a little bit of extra temperature to get the solution to boil. So while water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, maybe the ethylene glycol solution boils at like 110 Celsius. So the delta T would be 10 degrees higher. And we'll see how you can actually calculate, by the way, those delta T values. But the important part here is that all solutions will boil at a higher temperature than the pure solvents they came from. So if you have water, it boils at 100 degrees Celsius. If you start putting sodium chloride, a solute, in the water to make a sodium chloride solution, the solution will boil at a temperature higher than 100 degrees. This is called boiling point L elevation and there's some really cool things that you can do with this. The equation that's used for boiling point elevation is delta T equals K times M. M is molality, so moles of solute per kilogram of solvent. K is a constant that depends on the solvent you're looking at. And if you look in the lower uh, kind of uh, bottom part right there, these values on the left of my red line, those are all boiling point K constants. And it depends on the solvent you're using. So water is 0.51, benzene 2.53, etc., etc. We'll talk about the freezing ones to the right of my red Red line in a little bit. If you multiply the molality times the K, that's going to calculate the change in temperature, how much higher the solution boils relative to the solvent. So you can see that the amount, the delta T amount, will depend on the molality, which is how much solute you have in the solvent, but it does depend on the type of liquid as well. Here's an example of how this works out. So let's say we have, again, 62.1 grams of the ethylene glycol, which is 1.00 moles, in 250 grams of water. And it says, what's the boiling point of the new solution? Now, water normally boils at 100. Our answer here had better be a number that's larger than 100 degrees. Now, to answer this, we're going to need the K value for water, and it's 0.512. If you look in the text, book, that's what pops up. Um, and delta T, the amount of temperature it's going to be higher, equals that K value times M. So the molality, as we saw in a previous example, was 4.00 molal. That's the little m. And we'll multiply that number by the k by 0.512 to calculate delta t. If you do that, delta t comes out to be 2.05 degrees Celsius. That's the amount that the boiling point has increased. So water normally boils at 100. If we're going to add 2.05 to it. The boiling point of the uh, ethylene glycol solution, 102.05 degrees Celsius. So this is the effect of having a solution, boiling points are higher. But there's another effect that happens with solutions. So, so far we've seen and talked about how the vapor pressures are decreased and boiling points are increased. But another thing happens when it comes to freezing points. Now, the freezing point of pure water is zero degrees Celsius, all right? And that will happen when liquid molecules going to the solid phase uh, are equal to the solid molecules going to the liquid phase. Um, we're going to see that solid 
solutes act as blockers once again, but instead of blocking liquid going to gas, they block liquids going to solids. So it's going to take extra cold temperatures to allow the liquid molecules to form on the solid part. The punchline here is that if you have a solution, the solutions will freeze at a lower temperature than the pure solvents. And I'll show you some videos here in a second. But I do need to apologize for these videos. Both of these videos show the pure water with ice cubes at the bottom of the beaker. And like we talked about extensively with hydrogen bonds, the density of ice is less than the density of liquid water. So ice cubes are supposed to float all right and these videos show the ice sinking to the bottom so i apologize for that however the ideas are still sound just ignore this animation typo when water freezes its molecules leave the liquid phase and attach to other molecules in the solid phase at the freezing point an equal number of molecules move into and out of the solid phase a solution of ethylene glycol automobile antifreeze has a freezing point lower than that of pure water. Molecules of the solute block the interface between the solid and liquid phases, thus decreasing the rate at which molecules leave the liquid phase and attach to the solid. So in a pure solvent, all right, liquids going to solids uh, have to start happening. There is always some solid going to liquid. It's an equilibrium like we've seen. In a solution, it's the solute that blocks the liquid particles from going to the solid phase. So you have to make the solution even colder than you would with a regular solvent. The coldness makes uh, it harder for the solute molecules to block, basically, the liquids going to the solid phase, and that's why uh, takes a lower energy to make the freezing start happening. So in all of the said and done here, solutions are going to have lower freezing points than the pure solvents they came from. And that's another one of these colligative properties. This shows, um, this is actually basically the same things I saw earlier, but what's important here is that the equation for freezing point depression is almost identical to the equation for boiling point elevation. It's a delta T equals K times M. However, it's not quite the same. This is a delta T for freezing points, and the solution will be uh, not as cold as, or the solution will be colder, excuse me, than the solvent it came from. So it's a delta T freezing point, and that's equal to a different kind of a constant. It's a freezing point constant. So let me draw my little red line that I had on the previous slide. And while before we looked on the left for boiling points, now we're going to look on the right for the freezing point constants. And just like with the boiling points, every solvent has its own freezing point constant, K. So water is 1.86, benzene 5.1. 1, 2, etc., etc. And again, you have to think about the freezing points. So if we calculated, say, a delta T of 2 degrees and it was in water, then we would expect the water solution to freeze at negative 2 degrees. It would be lower than the freezing point it came from. So let's calculate the freezing point of that 4.00 molal ethylene glycol water solution that we talked about earlier. And again, the KFP, the freezing point constant here for water, 1.86. So just like before, we're going to calculate delta T first. Delta T equals K times M. So 1.86 times 4.00, the molality, comes out to be 7.44. Now normally, water freezes is at zero, that means that the solution is going to freeze at 7.44 degrees less than that, or negative 7.44. So that's how you calculate the freezing points. Now, a little bit of a warning. Sometimes in certain textbooks, people will use a negative KFP value or negative KFPs. So instead of the 1.86, they might list it as negative 1.86. And honestly, that's fine. They're 
trying to correlate a negative K with a negative delta T. The only important thing you need to realize here is that molality, the M, it's like a mass, like molarity, and you can't in chemistry have negative mass ever, okay? So I don't care if your K is positive or negative. I don't care if your delta T is negative or positive. That doesn't bother me either. But the two things I do want you to know is that first of all, molality is always going to be a positive number, no exceptions, all right? And whatever delta T you calculate, the delta T will be that much less than the regular freezing point. So in this problem, we had a positive 7.44. You need to be hip enough to know then that the freezing point of the solution will be 7.44 degrees less than the regular freezing point. So that's the negative 7.44. We haven't talked so far about the effect of ionic compounds when it comes to colligative properties. So far, we've been focusing on solutes like the ethylene glycol and iodine, stuff like that. Something strange happens with ionic compounds. So let's talk about that. So let's say this was a problem you had. You want to know how much sodium chloride was needed to dissolve in four kilograms of water. And we want to lower the freezing point by 10 degrees. So we want the freezing point to be negative 10 instead of the normal zero. Okay, no problem. So first we're going to calculate the molality. Remember that that little m has to be positive regardless of what you do. If you need to absolute value the delta t and the k, that's not a problem at all. So solve for molality. Molality comes out to be 5.38 molal. So if we have a 5.38 mol molal solution, that's going to make the freezing point negative 10. All right, and that's not a problem. However, Remember that all these colligative properties depend only on the number of particles and not the type of particles. And ionic compounds, especially if they're strong electrolytes, they don't stay as themselves. Like NaCl doesn't stay NaCl. NaCl breaks up into Na plus and Cl minus, i.e. you get more than one piece per mole. So for NaCl, you're going to get two moles of particle per one mole of ionic solute. The little m just represents total number of pieces, total number of particles, and you get two particles per NaCl. If you had something like magnesium chloride, MgCl2, that would break up into Mg2 plus plus 2Cl minus. You would have three moles of particle per mole of ionic solute. So ionic compounds, you must think about the number of ions, and that's going to reflect itself in these calculations. Back to sodium chloride. We need a total solution concentration of 5.38 molal, but that's 5.38 particles per kilogram, if you will, of solvent. There are two particles per mole of NaCl. So what you can do to get it into sodium chloride is you can essentially divide it by two. It's 5.38 moles of particles. There are two particles per mole of NaCl. So if you divide 5.38 by two, you get 2.69 moles of sodium chloride needed per kilogram of solvent. Now there are four kilograms of solvent. The sodium chloride mole mass is about 58 grams per mole. So you can turn 2.69 moles of NaCl into grams of NaCl and then multiply it by the four kilograms of water to get rid of that. You're going to need 629 grams of NaCl to place that in four kilograms of water and that should make your freezing point 10 degrees lower than pure water. So the amount of dissolved particles becomes super important for ionic compounds. A person named Van Hoft, all right, Van Hoft, Van Hoft is how I think people say it, came up with a small addition to the freezing point and boiling point equations. Instead of being just delta T equals K times M, you can add on delta T equals K times M times I. And I is called the Van Hoft factor. And the Van Hoft factor just represents the number of particles produced 
per mole, or officially number of particles produced per formula unit. Ionic compounds are usually represented as formula units. So let's look at some examples. So ethylene glycol, like all organic covalent pieces, is just going to have an I value of 1. So we haven't talked about Van Hoff factor yet because all the examples I've shown you have been with um, covalent molecules, things like ethanol and sugar and acetone, anything with nonmetals, nonmetals that dissolves well in water I've been using so far. If you have an ionic compound, then you just think about the number of pieces. So we saw earlier how NaCl breaks down into a positive and a negative. So if you have an NaCl, it breaks down to an Na plus and a Cl minus. That's two pieces. That's the theoretical value of this Van Hoff factor I. Calcium chloride breaks down into a calcium 2 plus and two Cl minuses. So you get three particles per mole of CaCl2. That's why the I factor is three. Now we're only going to use what's called the theoretical values of I in Chem 222. Um, theoretical values are what they should break down. All is going well. A lot of times the actual values are less than the theoretical values, but that's something you can look at in future courses. We only really need to talk about Van Hoff factors with ionic compounds. Again, if you have something covalent, uh, some kind of organic molecule that dissolves in water, it's not a problem. However, if you've got something organic, got to take care of it. Here's a question you might see. Which aqueous solution is expected to have the higher boiling point? And it's 0.10 molar sodium chloride and 0.15 molar sugar. And then it says pure water will have the higher boiling point. Well, first of all, C is flat out because all solutions will have higher boiling points than the solvent they came from. So C is just silly. And initially, you might think that answer B would be right because you can see delta T equals K times M. Molality as it gets bigger makes a bigger boiling point so it'd be tempting to say B. However, answer A, sodium chloride, that's an ionic compound and with ionic compounds you no longer have I equal to 1. In sugar I equals 1 but in sodium chloride I equals 2. So a I factor of 2 times 0 0.10 is like 0 0.20 and that's bigger than 0.15 sugar times 1.15. K is the same in both of them. So the answer here is actually going to be answer A. Watch out for those ionic compounds. They will affect the boiling points and freezing points quite a bit as you can see here. The real utility, though, of these properties comes from the ability to find the molar mass of a solute. Now, in the gas laws, we saw how PV equals NRT, and you can go about solving for the molar mass, which is really great if your liquid can be vaporized or it's for a gas. The colligative properties of boiling point and freezing point will allow you to find the molar mass of a solute under a lot more diverse kind of situations. And this kind of process is super handy. In the freezing point lab that we're going to do in Chem 222, we'll talk about a way that you can solve for the molar mass, stuff like that. This is an example of a boiling point problem, and we're trying to find the molar mass of azoline. And azoline is a compound that does dissolve in benzene, all right? And the normal boiling point of benzene is 80.100 degrees Celsius with azoline in it, it's 80.230 degrees Celsius. And there's the boiling point constant, etc, etc. Now, because this is benzene, and benzene is very nonpolar, we don't have to worry about the Van Hoff factors here. These things are already going to be nonpolar I factors equal 1. So we're already uh, in our, we're out of the realm of ionic uh, metals plus nonmetals. We're just going to use delta T equals K times M. If you're trying to find the molar mass of azoline, azoline is the solute. So we want grams of solute divided by moles of solute. And 0 0.640 grams, that is the grams of solute. So the rest of this problem, we're basically gonna try and find the moles of solute and then push it back into the molar mass equation to find the molar mass of azoline.
the delta t, delta t equals k times m, all right, delta t for this problem is the difference between the solution and the pure solvent boiling points, 0 0.130 degrees Celsius. And delta t equals k times m. We've got the k for benzene, 2.53. So let's solve for molality. Molality, 0 0.130 is the delta t divided by 2.53. That comes out to be 5.14 times 10 to the minus 2 molality. And that represents moles of solute per kilogram of solvent. Well, 99.0 grams is the grams of solvent. We can turn that into kilograms and multiply it by the molality to get moles. So the 5.14 times 10 to the minus 2 times the kilograms of solvent, 0 0.09990 kilograms, that gives you the moles of solute, moles of azoline. And that's 5.05 .05 times 10 to the minus 3 moles. All right, that's what we were looking for. Now we can solve for the molar mass because 0 0.640 grams of azoline created this effect, which was 5.05 .05 times 10 to the minus 3 moles, grams per moles, molar mass 127 grams per mole. That's the molar mass of azoline. This is a really cool technique. If you want to do this kind of quick and dirty, the little equation there in purple, molar mass equals grams of solute times the K value divided by the delta T and the kilograms of solvent. This is something that I've used quite a bit, so this, hand, this equation comes in super handy. You don't have to. You can also go through the steps in this problem. This process works for both boiling points and freezing points. So in this problem, it was how much higher the, sol the solution was relative to the solvent in a boiling point. You could also do this for a freezing point. The delta T would be the difference between the freezing point of the pure solvent and the freezing point of the solution.